three hey welcome back to another epidose of these crazy guys that just eat meat and talk and talk and talk and never shut up uh today we're doing another short ribs a little short video to sort of answer concisely answer a question um this one was another request uh from my buddy dan he uh i started talking about this he's like why don't you put that in a video it's like okay dan i will because you're right so we're going to call this one the brief history of carnivore. I'm going to step it back and I'm going to include sort of the whole uh, low carb umbrella, particularly keto. Um, people relate to that really well. So key, the ketogenic diet is essentially a high fat diet. And yes, that fat can very well be animal fat, which a lot of us have been brainwashed into thinking it's bad for us. It's going to give us heart disease or something like that. But really where keto comes from is uh, way, way back. You can see writings of people noticing that people who are having seizures, let's say presumably epileptics and people who are having um, psychotic breaks or um, were experiencing like schizophrenic like symptoms they notice when they they stopped feeding these people because oftentimes they were locked up because they thought they were possessed or something uh when they stopped feeding them they started coming back to normality you know their their cognitive functions improved and their psychiatric symptoms were reduced and this is something that was known for hundreds of years written about for hundreds of years at the very least and so doctors started thinking, well, essentially what's going on is these people are fasting. And when you're fasting, what you're doing is you're burning your body fat because we can very quickly burn through any sugar we've stored in our blood or our liver or whatever. There, we, we can't really store that much sugar. So, uh, but body fat, we can store lots of, I mean, every pound of body fat is somewhere around 3,500 calories, which is more than enough for most people for an entire day. So um, even a good person who's lean, let's say you weigh a hundred pounds and you got only 10% body fat, which is really lean. That's, you know, 10 times 3,500 calories. So that's 35,000 calories. So even a person who's relatively lean can live a long time on their body fat. The opposite, uh, would be, you know, sugar, which typically most people, if they don't eat, is going to burn up pretty quick, uh, like in a matter of hours. So um, they realized that there was something to fasting that helped people. Um, and so they decided to come up with a fasting mimicking diet. And that's basically the keto or ketogenic diet. Uh, the ketogenic diet is known as a keto diet because it can measure something in the blood called uh, a ketone body um, or beta hydroxybutyrate. And they noticed that when they were treating children back at the early 1900s before they had seizure medications if they kept their their keto their ketone levels high by feeding them a high fat diet that uh, they frequently um, improved their seizures or some some people it it eliminated their seizures some people just needed less medication or some people uh, of course they, there weren't very many medications back then so you have this whole concept of a fasting mimic mimicking diet, improving um, these uh, very serious symptoms. And then they started noticing other side effects, you know, like weight loss or uh, joint pain going away and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the origin of the ketogenic diet. It kind of faded once there were more uh, medications available, but then, um, people sort of revitalized this, this concept. And from a historical standpoint, I like to point out that we can go back 3.7 million years in the fossil record and see that pre-humans or other hominids before us were just eating meat. They were cutting uh, meat off the bone with primitive tools and they left tool marks and also later in the fossil record, you could recover collagen from fossils believe it or not fossils aren't 100 percent mineralized and so when you extract the collagen from the fossils you could take it to a laboratory and the physicists measured the isotopes and usually the nitrogen isotopes but there are other isotopes to tell exactly what those people are eating or animals are eating and 
human beings and pre-human beings were clearly hyper carnivores. They were eating other carnivores. They were eating meat. And if you look in the bone piles and the all these dig sites, you find out that one of the foods we ate a lot of were things like woolly mammoths, mastodons. They were all over the place. They were relatively slow moving and they were not afraid of humans. So we were, we had an easy time just walking up to them and spearing them, letting them bleed out. Or we dug pits. There's mammoth traps all over the world where they had pits. They tricked the mammoth to fall in there and then they just jump in there and stab them and everybody eats for a week. So when you combine all this, you find out that, well, yeah, we've been eating meat for a long time. And so that's kind of a brief history of carnivore uh, compressed uh, across time. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Justin has something to add about some of the more uh, um, current uh, carnivore trends. Yeah. So um, can't talk about carnivore without uh, mentioning, you know, Phil uh, Lowe, Vesson, oh man, I'm going to butcher his name. I'm already butchering his name. Fat of the land, damn it. Um, Vil Helmer. Vil Helmer, yeah. Um, I think he's the he's the modern day saint carnivore, right? Um, he kind of kicks this whole thing off uh, with, uh, you know, the Arctic exploring. Yeah, he wrote a book called Fat of the Land, or, uh, and uh, he lived in the Arctic Circle in Greenland, I believe, with Inuit Eskimo type type people where he just ate meat for years. And and he interviewed, you know, there's interviews of him, what, in the late, the early 30s, right? Or late 20s, something like that, of him, you know, talking about it, how great he felt and everything. Yeah. And he's one of the only people, it was him and, and another guy that actually did a whole year in a metabolic ward, carnivore, had blood tests done and everything was stellar. Yeah, when he came back and was talking about how he lived on meat and he, and he was really healthy and everything, it, even back then, people were skeptical. Now, you can see uh, interviews of Stephenson uh, on YouTube. We read the book. The book uh, is out of copyright, so you can find free copies of it or you could buy a, a used copy on um, eBay or even Amazon or something like that and read it for yourself. Um and yeah, they were in a locked ward at Bellevue Hospital so that uh, people could watch them eat nothing but meat for a year and do all the blood tests and see for themselves as a as an actual observed piece of science, an actual formal study. And then I believe they did a whole nother year after that outside of the locked ward where they just they just ate meat. But then they're like, eh, can we have some coffee? Might if we have a little whiskey with that? So they were living relatively normal lives for the for the people of that time and probably our time really um and they just lived on meat and they were healthy just like and and we we know now that there's populations all over the world that have done this not just the eskimo or the inuit but also you know in uh scandinavia and uh you know you go places like ethiopia and stuff like that and people still sit down and eat raw meat Right. And then we fast forward roughly 40 years to the 1960s, the hippie movement and all that. And until you get into this space, you probably never heard of the bear, which was the roadie for the Grateful Dead. And around him, the whole vegan thing going more plant based was starting to kick off part of the hippie movement. And he he was like the meat, you know, he feels best. With it. He just kind of knew on his own. Um, at least from his writings, which you can see, um, no one really tipped him off or anything. He just kind of had it kind of instinctual and, and he pretty much only ate meat, uh, essentially from what I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And he wrote about it and, uh, that kicked off some more movements. Um, you know, a lot of us that have been in carnivore for a while, we're familiar with Charles Washington and his group. He's, uh, uh, He's a car, full-time carnivore, marathon runner, all around, just typical American guy. And uh, he worked with a lot of people. He, he used to have a website before even Facebook. He worked with a lot of people that we've gotten to know, like Dr. Lisa Wiederman and um, Laura Spath. And uh, who else am I forgetting? 
there's a lot of people that are readily uh, present in the carnivore movement now that we get to talk to pretty frequently. Kelly Hogan. Kelly she Hogan. Was part of that original group. And then uh, we did an interview with uh, Mark. Mark. Uh, uh, what's his last name? Win. Wim, Wim, Wimmer. Yeah. Mark Wimmer. These guys have been carnivore now for 10, 12, 13 years. The Andersons are well-known couple that have been carnivore for that long. And of course, Amber O'Hearn, she's been carnivore for quite a while. She's written quite about quite a bit about it and interviewed most of these people. So the there's people, there's, there's the historical record of communities all around the world that just hunted animals and ate them and weren't, uh, I mean, when you live above the Arctic Circle and stuff like that, there's not a lot of vegetation to eat. So um, these people eat things like caribou and seals and stuff like that. And, you know, other other large animals, even bears and stuff like that. And they've, they've lived this way for hundreds or thousands of years. So we have that. And then we have the modern subset, starting with Stephenson writing his book. And then people like the bear publishing stuff online about how it resolved his health issues and then a little closer up we have this group like that we associate with charles washington zeroing in on health zero in zero on carbs health. in yeah. and these were just like little message boards you know um and then now to move it even faster i mean probably the most impactful interview that would say have to go in the history of carnivore is sean baker on joe rogan three years ago I mean, you talk to so many people, it's like, oh, how'd you start carnivore? It's like, I heard, you know, Sean Baker yeah, on Joe Rogan. Sean Baker. Yeah, and decided to give it a shot. So got to throw him on there. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, as far as breaking it wide open to greater, broader awareness, nothing was bigger than Dr. Sean Baker showing up on uh, Joe Rogan's show. And if you follow Joe Rogan, you know he's on and off carnivore. He claims to have a weakness for linguine with clam sauce that pulls him off from time to time. But, uh, yeah, that was a big deal for a lot of us was seeing Sean on there. Of course, Sean's probably one of the biggest cheerleaders um, out there. The guy's making videos every day. He helps coaching people every day, building companies like uh, Meet RX to help people every day. And so there's a lot out there um, if you want to look at it. Um, and that's kind of the present present sort of snapshot of what's going on with carnivore. But I like to, I like to uh, also remind people about uh, the letters on corpulent, the letter on corpulence, which was written by a undertaker of all things from, I think I believe it was the late 1800s. And um Basically, the guy was overweight and he was he tried all kinds of um, all kinds of different diets. And finally, one of his uh, friends who was a surgeon said, look, man, just eat meat, go back on the beer and the bread, you know, and eat some wild game and some fish and stuff like like that. Um, I'm going to see if I can. I forgot his name, so I got to look it up. I usually remember this off the top of my head. Um it's William Banting. So oh. William Banting uh, lost a lot of weight, got his health back. And he published a letter that he just gave, he just gave out. It's called the letter on corpulence addressed to the public by William Banting. And so he used to have it printed out and handed out to people for free because um, he, it worked so well. And then um, in other countries, instead of using the term dieting, they actually use the term Banting. So I know sometimes we talk to our counterparts like in South Africa and stuff like that. They, they call it banting. So that's how popular it is. And do I have the date here? I'm going to say it was the late 1800s, but um, I could be wrong about that. And then the other, the other book I like to point out is um, a studies, studies in deficiency uh, by... I did a video on these too. So I have, I have, um, oops, I have uh, some little videos on specifically on these books if you guys want to hear about them. But it's Studies of Deficiencies by Robert McCarrison. McCarrison. And McCarrison was a, I believe he was like a, an officer in the British military. 
and uh, he published this book around 1920, 21, 22, something like that. But basically the army had charged him with trying to figure out what to feed people because um, they had a large military presence in India and, uh, you know, with this large uh, group of people that they needed to feed and keep healthy. They want, wanted a doctor to do an actual study of which diets work the best. So he basically studied the populations of India, which were kind of stratified um, into people who ate a lot of uh, vegetable matter and then sort of medium. And then people in another region that ate a lot of meat and dairy. So, um, and it, he, he studied the populations. Then he did a bunch of animal studies on top of it. So what we find out, you know, this book that's basically a hundred years old is that the people that were eating the meat and dairy were the healthiest, had the lowest heart attacks and so on and so forth. So anyways, this, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was going to throw out one more, uh, Weston A. Price, the dentist that went around the world looking at, you know, the teeth and cavities and everything and, and looking at the people that primarily stuck to mate, to meat, eating meat and fat had the least, uh, dental cavities and and uh dental issues yeah i think i have that book right here so it's nutrition and physical degeneration by weston a price so it's a great book um when was that written or when was that published originally this one's the eighth edition 24th printing and i'm not sure when it originally came out i think it was the 50s but, but basically, you know, Weston A. Price went around the world studying populations and naturally looking at teeth and overall health. He thought he was going to find this uh, vegan, vegetarian type um, uh, population out there that was really healthy and he never found it. And he, like Justin said, he found the opposite is the people that ate the most meat were the healthiest. So you can see that now. I know, uh, you know, so the people have come back. They go live with the different pop, with the different uh, traditional um, people in in Africa, in different countries and different regions, and it's the ones that live mostly on meat that are the strongest and healthiest there as well. So, the there's something to be said, and and of course, in when we look at the the bones or the skeletons, um, the remains of populations from the past. As you see agricultural move in and people start cultivating crops, particularly grains and stuff like that, you can see they have more more uh, cavities. Their brain uh, volume goes down. They have more joint disease, more cancers, more tuberculosis, and other diseases. All these things that could be detected in their in their uh, their mortal remains after all these generations indicate to us that when you live on meat you are in fact going to be healthier so anyways that's kind of carnivore in a nutshell the brief history of it that's the sort of the the meat and potatoes of as it were of 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 the uh, sort of sphere of influence and documentation and so so and so forth that we uh, we re we reflect on frequently so we need to make a carnivore timeline. Yep, that would be great. So and we can and, and we could start it at uh, 3.7 million years ago as far as physical evidence goes. If you want to watch a video about stuff like or a movie about this, you look for um, uh, the perf in search of the perfect human diet. You can watch it on like Amazon Prime, probably Netflix, probably YouTube. Um, and it'll explain a lot of this, um, including the science. So I literally go to the laboratory and have a guy explain the uh, nitrogen isotopes in the, in, the, uh, in the fossils. So, and if you want to learn more about the keto, uh, you know, watch the movie, The Magic Pill. So um, that's a high fat diet movie. And uh, particularly uh, there's two, two children in there that are autistic. And uh, you'll see an example of how their quality of life vastly improved by going to a high fat diet and getting, getting rid of the sugar and the carbohydrates and the vegetable oil and stuff like that make a big difference. And at the end of the day, that's, that's it, the quality of life, right? That's, that is what, uh, what really matters is, you know, feeling good and being as healthy as possible with the time we have, right? 
Right. And uh, there was a new documentary that came out last year, Fat, right? Fat, the documentary, which is really, really good as well. Yeah, that's uh, Vinny Tortorich's, right? Vinny's a great guy. He's, I highly recommend his book, especially the audio book. If uh, it's called uh, Fitness Confidential and uh, Vinny's online. I know I tweet, I used to tweet the hell out of him. Um, and he always, I was uh, is appreciative. So um, I know my girlfriend, that's her favorite audio book is Fitness Confidential by Vinny Tortorich. So if you're into audio books or you just want to, you want to read the, the paper, paper copy, I highly recommend that. Um, the letter on corpulence, if you want to read that, it's short, it's online. Uh, Studies and Deficiencies by Robert McCarrison. It's available. I, I think it's long out of copyright. I think you can re read it for free on, on Google Books. Um, there's lots of PDF copies of that floating around as well. And same thing with uh, Stephenson's uh, um, uh, Out of the Land. Out of the Land, yeah. And the Bear's writings are also yeah. on PDF as yeah. well. So we'll try to post a bunch of links to all this stuff. Yeah. Explore it for yourself and see that there is a lot of evidence out there for populations that just eat meat and thrive on it. Cause I, I personally believe that it is the species appropriate diet is meat. So I don't think Justin would agree. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, pass this on to people be interested in the topic and uh make sure you're subscribed it really helps leave us your comments let us know uh, what your favorite uh your favorite references are for the carnivore diet maybe we can include them in a future video if you got questions if you got requests for uh future short rib videos like this where we just try and and go over an encapsulated question or concept so people can get a quick answer and not sit through an hour or three hours or whatever um let us know and, uh, you know, maybe pass this on to other people, help us grow the channel. It really makes a big difference. So until next time, eat some meat, feel better and whatever you do. Don't fall, fall down, down the down carb the hole.